All right, let's take a look at some examples of exponential functions. So I'm going to stick with the uh, compounding interest examples. So recall that the formula we're going to use when we're compounding a finite number of times per year is p times a equals p times 1 plus r over n to the n times t power. And they've told us what p is equal to, what r is equal to, so long as we convert it to its decimal form, 0 0.065. n is the number of times you compound. So if we're compounding daily, you could take n to be, say, 365. If you try to do, you know, 365 and a quarter or something like that to account for leap year, it'll make a small difference, and it won't... Um, I think you'll find it won't make a, a very big impact in the final answer. And t is the number of time, the amount of time in years that you're leaving the account to mature. So we're going to need to go back to the calculator here to figure this out. So we've got 8,000 times 1 plus r as a decimal is 0 0.065 and we're dividing that by 365 and then raising that to the 365 times 15 we're raising it to the number of compounds that this account is going to go through through its entire through its entire 15 year uh, life cycle so we're going to take 8,000 times 1 plus 0 0.065, divide that by 365, and then raise this to the 365 times 15th power. And what I get out is 21207 dollars and 49 cents if I round down as a bank would against your favor. So the final amount after 15 years is going to be you know, uh, $21,207 roughly. And to calculate how much interest was earned over that period, we're going to take this final amount, our value that we got for A, and subtract away how much we initially put into the account, the value for P. And when we do that, we get $13,000. So we almost tripled, we're maybe, you know, uh, a few more compoundings shy of tripling the amount of money that we initially put into the account. We'd hit three times the amount when we hit $2,400, three times our initial investment. So we've already gone past doubling, and we're almost to the point where we're tripling our investment. Let's mix things up a little bit and do 52, where we're given a goal of having $10,000 in an account, and in this case for 52, it's an account that's earning 8% interest annually, and it's being compounded quarterly. And we're asked what do we have to initially invest so that in 10 years time we reach our goal. So going back to the formula, we now know A. What we're trying to find in this case is how much do we have to initially put into the account? What 
do we have to put in right now in order to get the goal of $10,000? And if we're compounding quarterly, then that means n is 4. We're compounding 4 times per year. And they told us that we're letting the money sit for 10 years, so that tells us that our variable t is 10. So, I don't know what this weird number is going to be, but I do know that in order to solve for p, I'm going to have to divide both sides by whatever this weird number ends up being. 4 times 10 is 40. So if I just not worry about what this particular number is, I can say that the present value is the amount, the final amount, divided by 1 plus, and I could have done some arithmetic here because 8 over 4 is 2, so you know, r over n is going to be 0 0.02 to the 40th power. So again, we're going to have to go to the calculator because this is not something you can work out in your head. So I'm going to do 10,000 divided by 1.02 to the 40th power. And I'm going to get that roughly we should put into the account $4,528.91. And I'm going to round up because if I round it down here, then in 10 years time we're going to be just shy of our goal. But if I put in a little bit extra, at the very beginning, we'll not only meet our goal, we'll surpass it by just a little bit. And I'd rather surpass the goal a little bit, throw in an extra penny, and you know, get more than what I want, rather than be stingy, hold back that penny now, and in 10 years time have less than what I want to have. So this tells us how much we should invest now, given a goal and you know the interest rate, the number, how many years we're going to leave the account alone, and uh, how often the account is being compounded. And then 54 is kind of a nice twist on this. Everything's the same except how many times we compound per year. In this case, for 54, we're asked to compound daily. So it's still a goal of $10,000. The bank is giving us an 8% interest rate, which is fantastic for a bank. So we're compounding daily. And again, we're leaving this for 10 years. So everything's going to be the same. It's just that uh, N is going to change. N is now going to be 365. So doing the same technique here, I'm going to get that P is $10,000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.08 over, now N is 365. And the power is 365 times 10. So if I plug this into my calculator, it'll be interesting to see how much does the difference in compounding affect how much do I have to initially invest. So we have $10,000 divided by 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 365, and then we're raising the denominator to the 365 times 10 power. And so we're going to get that we should initially invest $4,493, and again rounding up, 69 
cents. So that's not a great deal of a difference. You know, that's what probably something like 25, you know, something around $25 difference that compounding more frequently gave. And you'd find that, you know, changing this to be compounding, you know, every hour, compounding every minute, compounding every second, that the difference is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, which is why it get it approaches that limiting process and you get the continuously compounded formula of A equals P e to the RT, what some people refer to as PERT, because it looks like that's what this spells out. P E R T looks like PERT. So increasing the amount of compounding really has diminishing returns. You know, you can keep increasing all you want but it's eventually going to converge to a specific value. It's not going to grow without bound.